So we have got Emma Vigeland joining us from New York. Emma, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, John. I wanna start off by talking about the big story of yesterday, and that would of course be Robert Mueller's testimony before two different House committees. Before we get into sort of the fallout, going into it, look, everybody had their own expectations, but I am curious, what were you thinking would come of it before he actually testified? What was I thinking about? Like, what did you expect would happen on that day? How did you think it would be spinned? What were your expectations going into what was being pitched as a major news event? Yeah, so honestly, I was very bored by the entire speculation about it. I did not think that much was going to come out of it. Robert Mueller said not much was going to come out of it. He was just gonna refer everyone to the report, and that's exactly what he did over and over. It seemed really like a calculated political stunt on Nancy Pelosi's part because everything he was gonna say was already in the report. And really it was just an effort for her to continue stalling on impeachment and also allow sound bites to get into the news so it would be heard from the horse's mouth. And that's exactly what happened. But it backfired in a lot of ways because it seemed like to Republicans and to conservatives that he was stonewalling because when Republicans were going in on him and hammering him over and over, he just couldn't say. So the optics worked both ways and I think it was tilted slightly in the Republicans favor, unfortunately. Okay, so I wanna return to the Republican strategy in a second, but let's start off because you mentioned that you think it was a calculated stunt, not by like the Democrats, but by Nancy Pelosi having to do with impeachment. Now, the Republican theory, is that she really does want impeachment and she's playing eight dimensional chess as a way to get there. It seems like neither of us believe that that's true. So if this was a strategy and she doesn't want impeachment, was the strategy to have this fail and derail conversation around impeachment right now? That would be very Machiavellian in a way that I don't think Pelosi is capable of. What's frustrating to me is there's this like fetishization in the media of politicians. So they pretend like or think that, you know, Trump is always playing 27 dimensional chess and he's pulling (laughs) puppet strings when in reality these are just human beings and they're pretty much as transparent as the rest of us. This isn't a house of cards come to life, Mm -hmm. this is actually real life. And so usually their motivations, if you're paying any attention are pretty obvious. So I don't think that Pelosi is doing anything to move impeachment forward. In fact, I think she wants the political ramifications of the potential of an impeachment of the American public believing that Donald Trump did something wrong without having to actually impeach. Because for many reasons, one, Trump is good for fundraising for her. for her, And two, she is in the brand of Democrats that is so shell-shocked by uh, by uh, Reagan and by what happened um, d- during the Clinton presidency and the backlash that the Republicans got from trying to impeach him in an entirely different circumstance, that she truly has internalized this idea that impeachment would be the death of the Democrats in 2020. When in reality, this is just another uh, part of her leadership, which is weakness and mm-hmm. fecklessness. And so that's really what she personifies when you're looking at her Democratic leadership. So this isn't Again, you know this this larger strategy. This is just a part of who she is as a Democratic leader, and that is someone who is beholden to donors and someone who believes in the politics of old. And the politics of old are don't don't rock the boat as a Democrat, or the Reagan Republicans are going to slam you in the elections, mm-hmm. and they're the strong party, and we have to be the weak party. And people like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib don't play by those rules. You raise a couple of points that I want to address. So I I, I largely agree with you about what uh, Nancy Pelosi wants to happen over the next year and a half. But but think about, we really do need to get better at identifying people for whom all of this thing that we dwell in every day. For some, it's like a hobby slash their career. And for other people, it's real life. Like she wants to raise money off of him and thinks that like a year and a half from now, it'll help by a point or two in the election. But the downside of the plan, even if she gets her way, is that he remains in power. 
and he uh, does a travel ban against Guatemala, which we're just reading he's gonna do. Maybe they uh, execute a few people. Maybe we start a war with Iran, like all of those consequences, that's real world stuff. We don't need to worry about that. We got political considerations to keep in mind. Yeah, that's such a great point, John, and it's so true because really, you know, I, I just saw that this is a now deleted tweet, but she was at some cocktail party with Maureen Dowd, New York Times columnist, last night, right after this happened. Everything's hunky dory because this is a political game to these people. And while Pelosi's heart is in a better place than, you know, like Paul Ryan or past speakers of the House, whatever, Kevin McCarthy, I, I don't, I'm not gonna equivocate and say they're the same kind of person, but it, it, it is a game, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what happens when you're in Washington for this long, when you play by these corrupt rules. The consequences of what you're doing feel very foreign to you. And it seems more just like days at the office and political games mm -hmm. that you're playing with your coworkers and everyone gets along, but the consequences of this are far reaching. Especially the notion that the most powerful person in the world is above the law, yeah. and yeah. Uh, that that's the the notion that she's perpetuating. And I don't know how she can look at young kids in this country who want to uh, and say, you know, we live by these universal ideals, these constitutional ideals, and still not hold the person accountable uh, who needs to be held accountable. Check out the Damage Report podcast each day, wherever you get your podcasts, whether Pocket Casts or Stitcher or iTunes. You can join me as I give you the news and stories you want with a range of co-hosts and interview guests jumping in on the fun each day. Again, that's the Damage Report, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you get them at iTunes, don't forget to rate and review. Sometimes I'll read them live on the show.